Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next topic now, ancient Egypt. Uh, you know, Egypt is, of course, a fascinating civilization, and I'm going to give you kind of an overview of all their dramatic history between about 3100 and 1200 BC, as you can see there. Uh, before we get into that, just a quick review. Remember, last time we talked about Mesopotamia, the dawn of civilization uh, in, you know, in Western civilization, and really in much of the world. Uh, Egypt is, of course, another of these <clears throat> dominant civilizations that, yes, is in North Africa, uh, but we also talk about it in Western civilization, world civilization, you cover it in many areas uh, because of its location. And so, you know, from the last lecture, you know, make sure you know the characteristics of civilization, how civilization began, uh, the issues of geography, which we're going to see in this lecture as well, uh, and all those key points there, all right? So make sure you're just, you know, you're on top of all that before you move on to the next topic here. So what do we want to start with? Well, let's go to our first set of keywords here. And this you could just go ahead and write down. And these are the major time periods of Egyptian history. Uh, you can see the Archaic period, Old Kingdom, First Intermediate, Middle Kingdom, Second Intermediate, New Kingdom. Again, you can always pause to write everything down. Notice the dates there. You don't need to memorize those exact dates or anything like that. I just kind of put those things for reference. Um, you know, the only time period that sometimes you may need to know is we'll get to 1200 BC. That's kind of a good date to know because that's going to pop up a few times. Uh, circa 3000 BC, you know, you see, you know, remember, if you remember in Mesopotamia, they started around 3000 BC. So does Egypt. So that's kind of where a lot of quote unquote civilizations begin. But all the specific dates of each time period, I'm not going to test you on, right? What you are going to need to know, and what's the objective of the lectures today, is to basically go through each of these time periods and know what are the big events of each time period. The one we're going to spend the most time on will be the Archaic period. We'll also talk about the New Kingdom as well. We'll go through all of them, uh, but definitely I'll spend the most time on the Archaic period for, for my set of um, lectures on ancient Egypt. Uh, so just be aware of that. So go ahead, get all this down if you haven't done so yet. And again, you want to know all the different characteristics of each time period and what happens. Uh, and I'll give you some name of some pharaohs, but that'll be more when we get to the New Kingdom. All right, so I hope all that's clear. Again, if you need to pause to get all the names down, that's great, or the terms down, that's great. Uh, and then we'll move on. Now, before we get to the Archaic period, the first thing we need to talk about is geography. So let me bring up a map of Egypt and talk about the geography and why geography is important in Egypt just like geography was important in Mesopotamia. So here's our map of Egypt and the key words you see there. And when you think of Egypt, you know, usually very quickly people think of a couple things. They think of the deserts and they think of the rivers. And so it's not enough just to know there are deserts and there are rivers. You have to understand, you know, the impact of these things. Why are these things important? And so, first of all, make sure you get the key things down. You have the Nubian Desert and the Sahara Desert. The Sahara is the one that more people are familiar with. The Nubian Desert is a little bit further south, gets kind of uh, cut off on the map here. Uh, you also have, you can see here, it says the Eastern Desert. Uh, so, as long as you know Sahara, Nubian, you know, Eastern is another good one to know, I guess. Uh, these deserts are important. Now, the question is, why are these deserts important? right and the obvious reasons that people think of is well it's hot right and you know if anybody's ever been in the middle east i've been to the middle east many times and if you go there in the summer it's ridiculously hot and so you know it's going to take somebody quite a bit of desire to say hey let's cross the desert and go invade egypt because it takes forever to get through these these deserts there's no cars no trains no air conditioning so you're not going to just go across the desert to attack egypt and so the reason why these deserts are important is they provide a, a sense of uh, security. It's kind of their, their force field uh, that protects them from invasions for a very long time. When you looked at the dates of Egypt, one thing I hope you noticed, all of that was Egypt. Yes, they were divided into different time periods, but it was all Egypt. In Mesopotamia, there was a bunch of different civilizations coming and going. In Egypt, it was all Egypt all the time, pretty much, with you know a couple of exceptions. And that's because they were so well protected. So remember, you have that chart I'm going to give you on geography. So you can kind of use that chart also to keep all this in, uh, in, on track. 
And so you definitely want to know that. Now, the other important part of Egypt is the river, and it's the most famous river probably in the world, the Nile River, and you can see again on the map here. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the Nile River is the Nile actually flows from the south to the north, right? It flows from the south to the north. And so because of that, you know, we kind of see these terms that sometimes mix up students. You know, the river flows from the south to the north. Most rivers we think of north go north to south. That's why if you look at the map here, let me erase this, you'll see where it says lower Egypt up top and upper Egypt down below because the way the river flows. So when we say upper Egypt, we're talking about the south. When we say lower Egypt, we talk about the north. So that's something that just sometimes mixes people up, so be careful on that. Beyond that, we need to understand again, why is the Nile important? And the Nile, you know, does the same things for Egypt as the Tigris and Euphrates did for Mesopotamia. It provides food, it provides water. And again, as always, you wanna get all these points down. You don't just want the key words, you wanna make sure you're getting all the important details. It provides water, it provides mud to build, it provides fish that you can attract that, that for food, animals that it attracts to hunt, all the basic things that the rivers give, transportation, communication. But there's more to the Nile River that's different from the Tigris and Euphrates. And a couple things that are different. One is its consistency. You know, remember we talked about the Tigris and Euphrates, I explained how the rivers sometimes overflow their banks and flood in the Epic of Gilgamesh, I talked about that. The Nile is very consistent, you know, when it's gonna overflow its banks, when it's gonna recede. And so if you're living along the Nile River, this gives you a big advantage. You know where to plant your crops, you know when, uh, what, what type of crops to plant, you know when you're gonna have your harvest, and it was very predictable. In fact, it was so predictable, a great little story, the pharaohs picked up on this, and we'll talk a little bit about the pharaohs in a bit. But when the pharaohs knew that the Nile was gonna overflow its banks, what the pharaohs would do is they would go to Upper Egypt, and they would get on some big fancy smancy raft, and they would wait for the currents to, to overflow the banks. And so the, 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 the Nile begins to overflow its banks and they get on a raft and they're going from upper Egypt to lower Egypt. Meanwhile, all the people in Egypt are sitting along the Nile River and the Pharaoh is getting on this raft at the same time that the river is rising. And it looks like to the people there that the Pharaoh is bringing water to the people. You know, that's really good PR. Um, and so even the Pharaohs picked up on that. So that's one really important point that I want you to know about the, the Nile River. It was very consistent. Another interesting thing about the Nile River is I explained how the river flows from the south to the north, but very often the wind currents went from the north to the south. Now, why does that matter? Well, what that allows is the Nile River to be very used very effectively for transportation, because if I wanna go from upper Egypt to lower Egypt, all I do is let the current take me and I get there. If I wanna go from lower Egypt to upper Egypt, I could use the wind power by building some sails, which the Egyptians were good at doing, and I can move up and down the Nile River very quickly. And so this allows everybody there to kind of unify and be together and be united. Uh, so that's the one very important point about the Nile River as well. It's just that consistency and how it flows and the wind currents combined made it, it like it moves. It's like a freeway, you know, it's like the 91 freeway, except it moves and you don't want to kill everybody on it. Um, and so it moves back and forth really quickly. So you have that. Um, what else? Another thing about the Nile River, one more point before uh, we go on to some other images here, is the Nile River, you know, when you look at the gods of Egypt, remember we talked about the gods in Mesopotamia and I said they were very malevolent. The gods in Egypt tend to be much more benevolent. Um, and the reason that is, is because they, they, there is a more positive atmosphere geographically, right? You're not invaded as much. You have the Nile River. And so you see, you know, the sun god or the god of the Nile, the hymn to the Nile. You know, you see these references as, as kind of the nurturer and the giver and so forth because of what it did. So that's what you have there as well. So you can see what I mean by how geography impacts things. It impacts them uh, in terms of stability, it impacts religion, impacts you know basic food supply, all of those things.
Let me show you a couple really dramatic images to show you how significant the Nile River is. So these next two images I think are really cool and I want to share with everyone. So here's an image, it's a satellite image, and it's the Earth at night, and it specifically captures uh, the Nile River. And you could see today, you know, all of this area roughly is Egypt. Uh, not quite that far south, but you get the idea. Um, all this area is Egypt there, and, you know, almost everybody in Egypt is living along the Nile River. About over 90% of the population of Egypt today lives right next to the Nile River, and it shows you the significance of the river all the way till today. And it's not just the Nile, you know, if you look at the global element of this, it's pretty remarkable. Look at this next image. I love this photo. It's one of my favorites. This is an image of the Earth at night. And when you look closely at this, it tells us so much. I could spend a half hour just on this one image, but you know, again, if you see very closely, depending if you're seeing this on a big screen or not, but there's the Nile River again. But you see much more than the Nile River. You see how almost everyone lives near the water. And even, you know, places where, you know, like Europe is lit up everywhere, very, very well lit up. Uh, there's always the edge. If you kind of find this picture and you can zoom into this picture, you can go online and find this picture easily. Just type in Earth at night and you can see how, how densely populated the, the borders are. Uh, you could see other geographical features, like if you look at India and the lights just stop, that's because there's the Himalayas. Uh, these dots over here, you know, that's Hawaii. And you can see, you know, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Hawaii it shows it's more developed. You see how the eastern part of the U.S. has more lights than the western. Well, where did we start from? The east. Uh, and there's so many different things you can learn from this map. One of the most dramatic, and if you get a chance to really go and find this image and zoom in, let me circle something here for you. Let me erase all these other marks here. And I'm going to circle. Now, I want you to ask yourself a question. So I'm circling over here. And here's a big blob of lights. That's Japan. And if you look right next to Japan, there's another blob of lights right over there, right? Right over here, I'm circling it as well. Now, when you first look at that, let me erase it so you can see it again. I ask my students, what does this look like? And very often students say, well, that's an island, except it's not an island, actually. There is a blob of lights and then it goes dark and then there's more lights. That's Korea. And I really encourage you to go and find a close-up image of this and it is stunning. You see where the lights just abruptly stop at the 38th parallel because you have North Korea and South Korea. And so North Korea, which is a communist dictatorship, and South Korea, which is a free capitalistic society, have completely different life, life living st um, standards there. The South is flourishing and the North is suffering. Uh, there, it's just darkness up there in the North. And that's, again, directly related to the fact of the governments and the politics there. If you ever want to know the difference between free democratic nations and communist socialist dictatorships, there you have it. Just look at that image. So there's a lot to this. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're covering ancient Egypt here, but I think it's pretty cool. All right, so let's move on now. Now we've covered the geography uh, and talk about some other key parts of Egyptian history. So we'll start with the Archaic period. Now, the Archaic period is the first time period. There are about, I think I'm going to go through like six or yeah, six things I want you to know during the Archaic period. And again, when I talk about in your notes, if I say there are six things you want to know during the Archaic period, make sure you jot them down. One, two, three, four, five, six. Because again, you can have a quiz question of what are two things that happened during the Archaic period. Or um, I might talk about something and say, when did it happen? And you'd have to know it was during the Archaic period as opposed to the Old Kingdom. Uh, so those are type of quiz questions that might come up. Now, were there people, again, the Archaic period is about 3100, 3000 BC. Were there people living in Egypt before the Archaic period? And the answer is yes, but it's not really united. And so what happens around the year 31, 3000 BC, the first point I want you to know, it's during this time that Egypt unites, right? And it becomes one Egypt instead of these little what they were called gnomes you don't need to know that term um, but they unite and what happens is there's a specific person named Narmer that's the first name you see here Narmer or Menace uh, sometimes referred to Narmer sometimes referred to as Menace and he was the king of Upper Egypt 
And what he does is he conquers Lower Egypt and he unites the areas. And on this other side here of the image, you actually see a very famous palette called the Palette of Narmer. And this Palette of Narmer helps depict the unification. And so I'm just going to go through this quickly. It's one item, two sides to it. And so we'll start over here on the left. And you see this big guy over here, the tallest guy, that's Narmir. Obviously, he's the biggest guy in the image because he's the most important guy. And he's standing over there smiting the other king, essentially. Um, down here on the bottom, you see these two people. They're probably running away. Uh, over here on the bottom, it looks like a bull trampling somebody. In the middle, it's actually two lions and their heads are being intertwined. And it's kind of symbolic of the unification. And then over here on the top, again, you see Narmer. He's walking. And then here on the side, again, if you're watching this like on your phone or something, it's really small. You won't see it well. If you see it on a computer or on a bigger screen, you'll see this really well. And if you flip this over, or turn your head, what you see there are actually decapitated people. And that shows us his conquests. And um, what you have actually is no heads here. And their heads are actually in between their legs. And if you get to a real close up, he didn't just decapitate their heads, he decapitated another part of their bodies, uh, which will be named Lameless, and that part of their body is actually lying on top of each head. So there you go, and you can look that up with all the detail you like if you want to. Uh, so that's the first thing that happens during the archaic period I want you to know about, the unification, right? So that's number one. So hopefully that's clear. Again, the person responsible is Narmer or Menes. So again, you can have a quiz question. Who was the person responsible for the unification of, of Egypt? And you would say Narmer. All right, number two. The second big thing that happens during the Egyptian period is one of the most famous things we associate with Egypt. And that is the story of the hieroglyphics. Now, the story of the hieroglyphics is pretty interesting. Um, and it's the writing that develops in ancient Egypt. But I want to tell you a little bit of story and show you some images about this. So the deal with the hieroglyphics is this. For the longest time, we had hieroglyphic writing, but nobody knew what it meant. No one can translate it. And so I'm going to tell you a little story of how hieroglyphics were translated. And it starts about the year 1800 AD. This is where our story starts. Around 1800 AD, there was a tiny little guy conquering all of Europe, and he wanted Egypt as well. His name was Napoleon. And so as Napoleon's troops are conquering and fighting and all this, Napoleon told his men, as they were fighting in Egypt, because at the time the British and the Ottomans and the French, everyone wants this piece of real estate, and so including the Egyptians, I covered that in my Middle East history class. Um, and so anyways, they're all fighting for Egypt. And so Napoleon, who was a megalomaniac, was also a guy who, who really valued ancient stuff. And he told his men, if you see anything that looks old, don't get rid of it, keep it, and so forth. Well, as his men are fighting in Egypt, some of his men um, have to build a fortress for defense. And they, they start unearthing rocks and stones. And on one of the stones, this is what they find. This, they find this stone and they see this writing on it. Um, the size of this stone is, I, I've seen it actually, it's in the British Museum in England. I've seen it several times in person. Um, I would say it's about three feet by five feet, maybe even smaller than that. It's been a long time since I've seen it in person. Uh, but what's really cool about it is there's writing on it. And there's three styles of writing on it. And this is not just any stone. It's called the Rosetta Stone. So you definitely want to know that term. And what you can see on it are the hieroglyphics on the top this other language called Demotic in the middle and Greek on the bottom. And let me move to the next slide. I think I have all the terms there for you. Yeah, um, so these are the same terms to that. So you have the hieroglyphics, Napoleon, and then Rosetta Stone, right? And so again, you have the hieroglyphics, which you have on the top. Demotic is this other form of Egyptian script. And then you have the Greek on the bottom. Now, since there's Greek on the bottom of this, what that tells us is that the stone was not made during the archaic period. So you got to 
follow the bouncing ball on this very carefully here, right? So, so pay attention. What we know about this stone, it was made around the year, and again, you don't need to memorize dates, but it was made around the year 200 BC. Around 200 BC, the Greeks were in charge of Egypt, specifically a Greek family known as the Ptolemy family. Uh, later on, if you know Cleopatra, she comes from that family. And so when the Greeks ruled over this Egyptian civilization, one of the rulers decided to write this decree on this stone. And he's Greek, so he writes it in Greek around 200 BC. But since he's ruling over Egypt, he's also going to write it in Demotic, and he's going to write it in hieroglyphics. And so what we have is the same thing written in three different languages. Well, you know, when this stone was discovered around the 1800s AD, people knew Greek, right? And so they were able to take the Greek take the hieroglyphics and figure out all the hieroglyphics. The person responsible for the translation is this man named Jean-Francois Champignon there. Um, he was the one who actually translated it you know, a few decades later, actually. And so you get the translation. So just to be clear on everything, I don't want you to mix up the dates and everything. So the stone itself was made about 200 BC, okay? It was discovered around 1800 AD, right, and then shortly after translated, but it represents the language on it goes all the way back to 33,000 BC, right, the hieroglyphics, right, and so it wasn't made, it was not made during the archaic period. Some students mix that up and say it was made during the archaic period. No, no, no. Uh, the, the language was around, but the stone is what allowed us to translate it. Um, and it was really remarkable because if you think about it, the stone was made in 200 BC. It had to survive until 1800 AD. It had to have all the languages on it for all of this to come together for, for this guy to be able to translate it. So pretty cool, right? And so that's the Rosetta Stone. And I definitely want you to know about that and all that story. So I hope all that's clear in terms of the time periods and what it, what it is. All right, so that's the second big thing. So the first thing about the archaic period I want you to know is the unification. The second big thing about the archaic period I want you to know is the, the uh, hieroglyphic, the writing. All right, a few other things during the archaic period. Let's move on. Uh, a few other key points there. Um, the third one is their gods developed. They are polytheistic. So I want you to know that. That's number three. Number four. Four is mummification began uh, during this time period, and this is an image of uh, Anubis. Anubis was the guy, I guess you could say, god of mummification for them. Uh, so they started mummification during this time. I have a little three-minute video I found uh, off the Getty website that's really cool. It's just short. Watch it. It talks about the mummification process, and so they developed that. Uh, the next key thing on the Archaic period is they did build pyramids, but not the big pyramids, right? The really, really big pyramids, uh, those are going to be built a bit later um, during the Old Kingdom, which we'll get to. Uh, so they built small things called step pyramids during this time. And then the last characteristic of the Archaic period I want you to know is that they did practice incest, and that started during the Archaic period and went on through all of much of Egyptian history, actually. And when I say incest, I'm talking about, you know, uh, brothers and sisters and moms and uh, sons. And you go, why would they do that? And the answer is to keep the power in the, in the family line. So it is something that also seemed to go as far back as the Egyptian archaic period. All right. So those are all the key things in the archaic period. So as I mentioned, that's the time period I wanted to spend the most time on. And so what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to pause here. And we'll do this as kind of the first part of the Egyptian lecture. And then we're going to move on in our next set, uh, next lecture on part two of the Egyptian lecture. And I'm going to go through the rest of the Egyptian time period, right? Just to break it up a little bit for you. All right. So I hope all that's clear. That's part one. And we'll get started on part two. You could jump right to it or you know, need a little break, take a break and then watch the rest of it. But obviously you need to watch all of it. All right. There you go. And uh, hope that was all clear. See you part two in a bit. Thank you.